Good afternoon, all. Welcome to the Grow Asia Digital Learning Series in partnership with Padang. My name is Adam Lyle. We've been very lucky to work with Grow Asia presenting this series for the last two years. While COVID has meant uh, this year's edition has been an online format exclusively, it has also allowed us to significantly increase our reach across the region and beyond, boosting attendance and post-event viewing. I guess an upside in a challenging time. We kicked off the year overviewing the now annual smallholder farmer agri-tech agri -tech landscape in Southeast Asia, which unpacks relevant technology, funding, and showcases uh, new and exciting startups. In the second session, we explored the exciting opportunity to use existing chat and social media platforms to reach farmers and drive greater engagement. While in the third quarter, we overviewed five successful business models for reaching smallholder farmers at scale. Both of these events, by the way, were built off two excellent Grow Asia reports by, led by Paul Vautier, who's the Director of Knowledge and Innovation. And they're still downloadable at uh, growasia.org. And finally, today's session on logistics tech, lessons for the agricultural industry. So, but before we start today's event, it's actually my pleasure to introduce Grow Asia's newest member of staff, Wu Wei Li. Uh, Wei Li joined as manager of innovation just last month. Wei Li will be a familiar face to many of you as she was most recently assistant director, industry development and partnership at Singapore Food Agency. And prior to that, AVA and Enterprise Singapore. A fantastic addition to the team. Welcome. We, we look forward to working with Wei Li as we plan our future collaboration activities together. Over to you, Wei Li. Thank you, Adam. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for spending part of your afternoon with us to tackle the timely topic of logistics tech in agriculture. Um, let me take you through the agenda for today's session. Thanks, JQ. Um, firstly, we'll have a presentation from Dan of NR Instant Produce, also known as NRF, um, giving us the Thai perspective on the challenges in agri-food logistics. And then secondly, we will have Junaidi sharing with us on how Gojek has tackled logistics challenges with technology. Um, then we'll be bringing in Sharon, Singi, and Damon to share from their diverse experiences. And this will be followed by a Q&A. So please do engage with our panelists by sending in your questions. Um, before we start, just a few reminders. Um, if you have any questions for the speakers, please type these into the Q&A um, box, not the chat. They're two separate things. Um, and if you have any specific speaker that you would like to address, just put their name in, or company in brackets uh, before your question. And if you have any technical difficulties at all with the Zoom webinar um, platform, please go ahead and uh, email my colleague Pranav at pranav at growasia.org. And uh, lastly, we will be recording this webinar and sending you the recording. It will be available online afterwards in case you missed any, um, any part of it. Um, at this point, I'd like to quickly just launch uh, a poll. Um, to give you guys an idea of who else is in the virtual room. Um, if, so if you could answer the question, where are you based? It would be nice for us to get a sense of, uh, of, of where we're coming from. And I'll just give you guys a, a few more, maybe five more seconds to answer. Okay. Um, I think you can see that we have quite a diverse um, range of Quite a few people calling in from Singapore, but also from the Philippines, Indonesia, other ASEAN countries, and outside of ASEAN as well. So that's really great. Um, and then the second poll we'd like to launch. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, what type of organization do you represent? Startup, investor, corporate, NGO, or government? I'll give you guys a few minutes there as well. Okay. I think you can see we have quite a spread as well. A nice um, representation from startups, 21%. Investors, corporates at 27% and NGOs at 36%. It's very nicely um, spread out actually. So thank you for that. Um, so 
Without further ado, uh, now that you have a better sense of who's in the room, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dan Patanvanic. Dan is the CEO of NR Instant Produce, um, a global manufacturer of sustainably produced foods focused on ethnic, plant-based, and functional foods. Um, NRF prides itself on being Thailand's first purpose-driven company to go public on the Thai Stock Exchange, and they also prioritize sustainable supply chain practices from procurement to production, storage, logistics, and distribution. Um, Dan, over to you, please. Um, hi. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so... First of all, I, I, some may be wondering why um, a food manufacturer is talking about logistics. And um, in a nutshell, as as, um, as we just mentioned, um, we are in the in, in the business of um, sustainably produced foods, and it's very important for us to have transparency, visibility, and a semblance of control um, within our supply chain. Um, integrating back to farmers, which led us on this journey. And the second part is we are building a global platform for plant-based foods, and we've been championing within Thailand and hopefully um, Singapore as well, um, that ASEAN can play a role in the production of plant-based foods and ingredients um, on a global scale. And from a distribution perspective, you know, so from supply, from ingredient, farmers, supply chain, all the way to distribution, um, you know, logistics has become a bottleneck, and I want to, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit of what I've um, found out over the past um, a year or so. And I'm glad that there's only one representative from the government, <laughs> so I'll maybe speak a bit more openly. Okay, um, next slide, next slide, please. So first of all, I, I do want to set um, as part of the agenda that Thailand is still. Um, a poor country in some respects. Um, next page. More than 20% of, um, of our GDP is still agriculture based. Poverty is, actu um, is actually almost at 9%. That was back in 2018. Um, with COVID, that's probably double digit now. Um, it's poverty, the poverty rate has actually increased twice um, over the past decade. Um, the southern part of Thailand is, has the highest incidence of poverty Real income has declined, um, reversing progress um, since 2013. And inequality, as mentioned, we are top in terms of inequality. So a lot of times, um, a lot of organizations, um, you know, a lot of the effort around helping poor people overlook Thailand, thinking that we are a wealthy country. We are, in fact, we are still a developing country that's stuck in a middle income trap. Um, next page, please. So at a glance, and I won't spend too much time talking about this, as everybody knows. So, you know, we, we are a, um, one of the largest net food exporters in the world, contributing 23% of um, GDP. And government-wise, uh, policies have been very accommodative. We have got 14 million farmers within our supply chain um, in, in the farming sector. And uh, we are top three, top tiered ranked around the world in multiple food categories. So the Made in Thailand is, is a trusted brand. Now, having said that, um, one of the problems is monopolization of, um, of, of purchasing. So 70% of all value-added products, right, are all owned by manufacturers and packing houses, both in fruit and agriculture. And that's a problem. This is why the farmers are, are poor, is because all the value-add is owned by, by corporate and big capital. And so, for example, when I, for example, as a company, go into the rural areas, the, the, the first thing to say is, oh, big capital is coming. You know, um, and uh, which is not the case for us in, in, in any event, because as, as mentioned, you know, we are very purpose driven and logistics is a key challenge to all that and specifically cold chain logistics. Um, next page, please. And so if you look at um, Thai competitiveness, um, we are we are not within the top 20 in terms of international competitiveness and logistics is one of those reasons. Um, if you look, um, if you look at today, um, our, the, the relative cost of um, logistics um, uh, as, as a percent of GDP um, is roughly about 14%. And that's, that's high relative to say the international average of 10%. It's very high re relative to OECD countries. And um, okay, within ASEAN, we're second ranked, um, but still uh, for th in, the, in, in the case for Thailand, if we want to truly um, become a global player, we have to do better. 
and we need to redu reduce um, our cost of logistics. And the Thai government realizes that. And a lot of investments have been targeted and earmarked towards logistics, but not enough has been targeted towards cold chain. Okay, next page, please. And so I'm about to um, show you three pictures. And I know this is about agriculture, but I bring this one up first, okay? Um, this is uh, a squid boat. Um, and then and the next page. And as you, as you can see, this is, you know, obviously durian. And there's a commonality between um, both of these pictures. And the next picture, next page, please. And mango. All these different people who work in the food industry and the agriculture industry are plagued by two parts, um, two key issues. Um, the first issue are unnatural monopolies that occur because of the bargaining power um, or the bargaining position of people within the supply chain. So in the first instance of the squid um, fisherman, he, he comes in at about four, four o'clock in the morning he, at the pier there's only there's a bunch of bidders trying to buy his product, but there's one bidder in particular who basically has the whole quota, and he unfortunately needs to sell all his squid to this one bidder at cost you know plus like a single digit digit percentage because they can't afford to basically uh, they don't have the working capital to basically stock the squid in, in a cold storage freezer, nor do they have a central facility to store it and then um, basically store it to a, a point where they can actually um, pack it and clean it and then deliver it um, into the city where most of the margins occurred. And the same things with durian and mango. And so um, some of these challenges are not just technological, but they're unnatural monopolies. So for example, like durian and mango, right? So um, they're, they're bought by, they're bought by companies. They're not packed by, um, by farmer groups or cooperatives. And then they're sent, for example, to China. And then what happens when they, when they arrive in a, in, a, in, a, in a container in China, um, they basically have four days, okay, to unload off all their, offload all their produce. So um, this, is, this is a surprising challenge. So when they, when they export their product into China, right, um, it's not pre-sold. So basically they're selling it on the spot to traders in China. And what happens is the traders know that they've got four days to basically release the product. Otherwise, um, the produce um, is, uh, you know, it, 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 just, it just spoils and they take advantage of that. And so the prices are driven down. And so cold chain, cold chain is very important um, to basically as an intervention point, if we could go to the next page, to basically help, um, to, to help um, farmers. So if you look at this price, right? Um, uh, I mean, this, 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 um, this picture. And so a lot of the cold chain infrastructure is basically within the central region, 80%, okay? But if you look at the Eastern region, which is where a lot of like the mango and durian are produced, or for example, like the Southern region where all the seafood is or the Northern region where there's also fruit as well, there's not enough cold chain infrastructure. And so oftentimes uh, fruits, vegetables, um, produce that, that should technically require um, cold chain and packing and delivery um, often are just transported in the back of a pickup truck. And basically by the time they arrive to the actual buyer, um, there's a deterioration in quality and hence, you know, they're not getting the value that they should have. Okay, next page, please. And so um, th there's a few areas for um, intervention. I think, for example, like an organization like Grow Asia in a multilateral context, um, I think in the rural industries, I think we need to work as a region and try not to out compete ourselves. Um, and I, I think that's number one. I think number two is, and this is very clear from my discussions um, with the government, and they have a they have a committee on this. Is is that it's it's um, they 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 haven't really mapped kind of the ecosystem uh, within Thailand and abroad, and they are unable to actually identify what are the key demand drivers. And so, for example, you have people and farmers who are blindly growing things and not knowing whether they can offload that, right? And this is where digital connectivity within the region, on a country cut by country basis, can actually help. Um, alleviate this problem. We have 824 cooperatives in Thailand, of which 90 are fruit and vegetable based, in which they have no visibility once the product is produced, where it's being delivered, because it's all captured by other people who make all that money, right? And so developing digital infrastructure and connectivity on an ecosystem basis is super important. And then making sure that the coaching infrastructure as close as possible to farm gate, right? To prevent food waste and increase farm gate prices is absolutely critical. 
uh, meaning that it's just not about technology, but you need, for example, groups um, um, groups to come together. And then what's really important is kind of upscaling kind of human resources to be able to um, execute on all of this, right? To understand, for example, that food does go to waste, right? And then I, I would say the last part is the, how do we transition all this uh, on an end-to-end -end basis towards a lower emissions framework? Um, next page. Please. I think this is the last one. And, and I want to leave, um, and I know I've, I've only had, um, I only have 10 minutes to speak, but I want to leave this last page. <clears throat> I've spoken on this topic for a lot, for, for, to quite a um, bunch of different groups about blockchain. And a lot of people don't see this, but in 10 years from now, there will be supermarkets, I won't name which ones, but I know that there will be supermarkets by 2030 who will require full transparency based on blockchain, right? If you wanna deliver canned pineapple into their supermarket. Now, I don't know the exact figure of how many people, farmers grow pineapple in Southeast Asia, but I'm pretty sure there's tens of thousands of farmer families. Now, by 2030, right? If they can't, um, if they don't transition to blockchain, they won't be able to sell into say like a supermarket in the US and then what do they do, right? And you know, the, this transition takes time. It doesn't take months. It doesn't take a year. It will take multiple years to transition a farmer onto blockchain. And I would um, strongly recommend that whatever initiatives take place that blockchain becomes part of it. Um, I wanna thank everybody for listening to me and I hope that this provided a, um, a different angle um, to the conversation on logistics and that sometimes it's just about not bought about the technology, but you've got to look at the unnatural monopolies that occur that are actually impediments to technological progress. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan, for setting the scene. I think that's really um, very insightful. Um, I'd like to go to our next speaker, uh, Junaidi, uh, who is head of Go Logistics at Gojek. Um, the products he oversees at Gojek include GoSend, GoBox, and Selly, which provide deliveries for consumers individual sellers and businesses in more than 70 cities across Indonesia. Um, in addition to managing logistics products at Gojek, he was also responsible for setting up acquisitions and partnerships for GoPay's offline acceptance and was COO of MAPAN, a group savings network serving rural and semi-rural communities in Indonesia. Uh, let me hand the floor over to Junaidi. Thank you. Thanks, Willy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a humbling experience for me to share what we are doing. Uh, or also what are we thinking from Gojek perspective about agriculture uh, sector. Honestly, it's a sector that uh, has been very close to my heart, uh, but it's a, honestly, it's a tough sector to crack, uh, not only from logistic perspective, but overall supply chain, demand side, so on and so forth. So, uh, so as, as, as mentioned in this slide, uh, uh, I probably gonna share our view about what we think about digital supply chain infrastructure. I think this is closely linked to Dan's presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to give a context, what is Gojek? Uh, Gojek has been, this is our 10 year. Uh, uh, we have been uh, developed, Nadim, uh, my, our founder, created Gojek and really the thinking is where the Gojek can, be, can help people in providing solution, either is inefficiency, access, access to customer, access to financial services. Next slide, please. Uh, and as mentioned, our main mission, and this is what really uh, embody in Gojek is we are really thinking about how we can remove uh, daily friction in, in consumer life. And, and the way we are doing it is through technology, connecting them to the best provider of goods and services in the market. Uh, next slide. Uh, some of you probably may not know, we have more than 20 services. Uh, next. And we have been operating in four countries in Southeast Asia, uh, 190 million downloads, 2 million driver partners, uh, almost a million uh, merchant partners that we have in our ecosystem. Uh, next slide. Uh, specifically on uh, on Gojek, uh, why I think we can achieve that kind of achievement because we always believe there will be three parts in the ecosystem. There will be a part related to consumer um, as the demand panel. There will be a part that is related to our driver or any kind of service providers. 
and there will be a part that is more on the seller or the so-called the manufacturers of the of the goods of the the goods that the consumer needs um, so it's not only one app that we're building we're actually building three different kind of apps for consumer for the service provider as well as for the producer in this case the merchants um, next slide specifically on 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 GoSend, the product that I'm managing, it's an on-demand instant delivery, focusing on on the last mile uh, uh, urban 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 delivery. Uh, this is just statistic numbers. Uh, next slide. Uh, so how how does we what kind of services that we provide? Uh, we provide instant delivery, so on-demand uh, delivery. Uh, we also develop our in-house uh, routing algorithm to make sure we can do batching and to do uh, a more efficient same day uh, same day delivery uh, for intracity. Next slide. Uh, and and we also equip uh, different kind of technology that we have uh, to 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 comply with our logistic offering. We have QR code to make sure the package is traceable. We have live tracking. So that consumer as well as the seller in this case can see where our service providers are. We have geofence and e-signature as the part to make sure uh, the the pickup or the delivery is really happening to the right customer. And to make our driver, our service provider, more efficient, we also have a, a technology to enable them to see the heat map of orders. Uh, nearby them uh, in the past few minutes so that they can navigate themselves, be closer to the heat map so that everything can be more efficient. Um, next slide. Now uh, we continue to, to think about how we can add, well, how we can create a den, honestly, in logistic uh, industry, because logistic is such a big thing. Uh, it's such a complex uh, ecosystem, and and honestly, what what we are really aiming is if we can just create a, a small den in the in the ecosystem to make more efficient. That's what uh, we are hoping, and and one of the thing that we launched recently is uh, creating a platform, technology platform, where we can integrate our our driver uh, to do the first mile and last mile, and integrating it to different kind of middle part uh, middle mile partners. Uh, we have launched a uh, few months ago uh, uh, so that uh, our consumer, our sellers can 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 do like instant delivery, but not only nation, uh, not only intracity, but can also do intercity. Uh, with this capability, we are also experimenting whether uh, one of the experiment that we are doing, one of the pilot that we are doing is whether we can connect to uh, a middle mile cold chain players. I think this is linked to Dan's uh, presentation where we can be the instant first mile, instant last mile connecting to uh, middle mile uh, cold chain players uh, and try to build ecosystem on that one. Uh, next slide. I think back to the topic, right? Uh, I, I completely agree with Dan about transparency, about feasibility, about traceability. At the same time, also reliability, and the way we we see the thing, at least in Gojek, is given that our mission has always been talking about consumer and consumer. Uh, what what we have in mind is one way is to think is let's start from the demand side. If we know who with who wants to buy a certain agriculture products, albeit is individual customers or even our our restaurant partners, right? having that feasibility will definitely help in the whole supply chain. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we have started by adding ready to cook, by adding groceries in different kind of form in our, in our consumer products. Um, that's, that's one side of thing. Uh, and, and the other side of thing, which is next slide, is something that, that very close to me as well. Uh, for those uh, probably really I've introduced, I used to work in, in Mapan that got acquired by Gojek. Uh, Mapan is a group buying for rural communities. And I think what, what we see uh, so far is 
the, the one of the challenges, of course, on the supply side. So once we tackle the demand side, the supply side is how we can organize, especially in Indonesia, because farmers are so fragmented. They don't have schedule. They don't have scale. Uh, how we can organize them uh, to make sure there is sufficient scale, there is efficient network, especially though for the first mile network, uh, and also quality tracing. And one of the idea that, that, that we have, this is what we learn in MAPAN, is enabling community leaders. For example, in these pictures, you can see the one in the middle is, is called Ibu Dede. He's the, he's the renowned community leader in Sukabumi. Uh, basically, people listen to her. Uh, and, and this is what we are, we, are, we are piloting as well and working with, with her, not only to enable the tracing of who are the best farmers, train the farmers as well in terms of what kind of fertilizer, what kind of equipments that they need to use, but at the same time also being the collection point uh, when we want to pick up for our first mile. Um, so yeah, it's again, it's still something that we incubate both from the demand side as well as from the supply side. Uh, and, and, and through this event, I really want to learn more from the audience here, want to discuss and, and get more understanding on this uh, last slide. And, and then in Gojek, we always believe any difficult problem, there is always a way to solve the problem. Thank you, over to you, Weili. Thank you, Janadi. Uh, thanks for ending on that very optimistic note. Um, it's important. Uh, this theme about community uh, influencers is something that we'll see coming back in our panel discussion as well. But let me just take a quick poll of the audience to make sure you are still awake and at your computers. Um, I wanted to ask you when you hear this, when someone tells you disruption to existing trucking and trading operations in rural areas, what is your first thought? Just click on your first thought that comes to mind. Is it that you think it's desperately needed or you think it's going to take a long time or you're already working on this and you want the other um, participants or panelists to come and talk to you about your solution? Or is it something you're not so sure, you suspect there's potential, but you, you're here more to understand the landscape? Um, I just wanted to have this poll so you, it can give our panelists some idea of um, you know, whether they are um, understand how to um, address you guys and your concerns better. Um, and with that, I think we'll, we can end the polling. Thanks, Pranav. So I'm glad to see that 50% of you agree that yes, we desperately need disruption to rural logistics to serve farmers and consumers better. And with that, I would like to hand the floor over to Graham Dixie, Executive Director of Grow Asia, who will be moderating the panel uh, with our five uh, diverse and accomplished speakers. Over to you, Graham. Thanks very much, Wally. Um, and thanks um, for attending. And uh, particularly interesting in, the, in those two presentations where you had um, Dan painting the picture of the real importance of logistics and how it it is something critical for both poverty, but also for GDP, and, and particularly focusing on, on the reduction in waste that could be achieved by it through cold chains. Um, and then Junaidi, who painted a fascinating picture of actually how this could be stitched together. I mean, just the you know, 20 different services, some very sophisticated digital applications, and he pointed out the the three different stages, the, the supplier, the drivers and delivery people, and the consumer. And then in the middle there, he talked about um, dividing that, that delivery into three stages, the first mile connectivity, the longer term connectivity, and the final mile actually delivering it. So it painted us a picture and a picture of, of considerable hope. Certainly when we have raised the question of the reaction to COVID, and, and one of the key questions that came out was that COVID has highlighted the weaknesses in the South Asian supply chain. And in particular, it has spotlighted the weakness in the first link, which is the first mile connectivity. And logistics is one of those things which is often understated, but really critically important. Uh, you know, you, you often talk to some of these off-takers, I mean, Olam is an example, who will often say that their success or failure depends on their logistics. So it's a key, key issue. 
um, and how can we do something about it? And, and the studies show it too. The very interesting work out of Africa showing that actually farmers' profitability and productivity is pretty closely linked to his distance from a market. So he's very highly productive, he gets well paid in the, when he's only two hours away from a major market, but all of that drops off precipitously if he hasn't got, um, if, if he's too far away from the market. And we are also faced with the considerable problems of roads. Um, a you know a two-lane highway will cost two to three million dollars a mile. Um, a rural road one lane is probably somewhere between um, half a million dollars and a million dollars. So big expense, but critically important. So let us now switch to um, the practitioners. Uh, and let's start with Sharon. Um, Sharon of, of Moore Nation, which told me that the name came from Moringa. But, but Sharon works fascinatingly in the space about how um, they, that they can deliver products into the rural space, so often for development agencies, but also she's been focusing on the difficulties of being able of the costs of transport, the needs about critical mass, and what might be the workarounds. So Sharon, um, over to you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Good afternoon, Graham and esteemed guests. Thank you for including us in today's session. I'm Sharon of Moria Nation Philippines. Our company was established in 2014 to align and integrate rural growers and local manufacturers to the value chain. We're also supplying and delivering essential goods in critical areas in the Philippines for the UN. I'll be sharing with you some of the challenges we face in rural logistics and our initiatives in addressing these. Um, Graham mentioned a while ago uh, what happened during the COVID. Actually, that's the first challenge I would like to share. During the summer, the pandemic was harvest time for many Philippine growers. Due to the inability of the market to absorb this and the slow reaction of the logistics chain to respond to the current situation, these harvests were eventually thrown away. To avoid further losses, our company partnered with private organizations to purchase truckloads of vegetables, and our company in turn matched this by purchasing truckloads of vegetables as well reaching some 18,000 families and 30 farm communities for their livelihood. The Department of Agriculture provided the consolidation and the trucks. In this particular challenge or in any issue we face, the involvement of multi-stakeholders in rural areas, the private sector and the government is critical. Another challenge that we need to address, um, Graham mentioned it a while ago, is the high cost of transport in the Philippines. As a trivia, it is more expensive to ship goods within the Philippines as opposed to importing this from another country. This year, we have used 12 full cargo 40-footer containers from Manila for the UN initiatives for the COVID. An average cost of one shipping container is twice that of importing a container from another country and takes twice the travel time because to achieve break-even status, a cargo vessel goes port to port to load and unload, until it reaches its destination port. This, including farm inefficiency and lack of support to our rural communities, contribute to the wide gap of our trade deficit, where we import more goods than exporting, while our agriculture backlines are being forgotten. In response to this, Mori Nation is spearheading the development of a digital source mapping and agricultural value chain integration platform for smallholder farmers and fisher folks. This initiative seeks to create an economic stimulus environment for 250 SFF groups or 25,000 farmers and fisher folks. Digital source mapping aims to streamline and assist rural logistics into being more cost effective and efficient through clustering, data analytics, and agricultural economics. This initiative explores a demand driven cooperative framework for agricultural source mapping that connects SFS to several stakeholders by means of a centralized database collected within the framework of an integrated production program. This platform highlights the complex interplay of the agriculture and economic system composing of communities and its stakeholders, including the logistics chain and its transformation, integration, and alignment into the food systems and supply chain. The third challenge I'm sharing is for me the biggest threat to the value chain inclusion and rural logistics. In 2019, we were tasked to purchase, extract, and deliver rice seeds in combat zones in the Philippines. When we were loading our seeds, our growers were crying. 
For the longest time, they thought they were forgotten. Clan war erupted in the area a few days before we dispatched her team. A few days later, gunfire, gunfight between armed groups. As, and so we share this now that we may never forget that the Philippine grains you often take for granted have stories to tell. More of pain, less of gains. In an agriculture country such as the Philippines, and now the largest importer of rice, our collective experiences in the sector highlights the need for deeper reflection and action. In an ongoing saga for growers, for growers who contend with climate change, poverty, and the struggle towards peace, we can rebuild more inclusive economies to set a new course for socially just and climate resilient world where no one is left behind if we also go to the peripheries in conflict-ridden fields as well where the forgotten are because we need to involve everyone in building a world we want. As we press for sustainable development and peace, we are supporting the UN initiatives. That is why we're with them in the rural communities with our deliverables. Thank you. Back to you, Graham. Okay. Thank you very much, Sharon, for, for that outline of some of the real issues on the ground and, and also a plea for progress and development. Um, let's switch over to Damon. Damon, um, Damon is, is very interesting that you'll find that he's actually been tackling these problems around how does he get production from farmers into the consumers, but he also talks about the trade-offs that if you can, you may be able to eliminate middlemen, but they also carry out a particular function. So Damon, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very happy to be here. So. Um, I think for, for those who are not very familiar with uh, Chile Valley, maybe let me start with a quick intro uh, of the company. So Chile Valley is the leading social commerce player uh, in Indonesia. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we are committed to providing quality and affordable products to consumers in a very convenient way. And, uh, you know, we, we, we run this, uh, you know, the group buy concept, you know, something similar to Mapan but uh, you know, with uh, uh, quite some differences. Uh, we empower uh, our network of uh, agents you know, who are normally stay-at-home moms to serve many end consumers. And by doing that, we consolidate demand and also supply. You know, we try to connect uh, suppliers, farmers, or collectors with consumers. And uh, in this process, of course, we, you know, we pass down the savings to consumers and also to incentivize our um, agents. Yeah. And uh, if you talk about the, you know, the supply of uh, fresh produce, you know, um, um, we, uh, on, on our platform, actually, you know, we sell a significant percentage of fresh produce and affordability uh, is always a key topic for us. Basically, we want our price, you know, to be competitive or to be reasonable. And, uh, you know, we, um, uh, to do that, we always try to um, go up the value chain. You know, when, when our volume was very small, um, it's, it's very difficult to do that because, you know, to go up the value chain, you need the MOQ, you need to meet the MOQ requirement. So we had no choice but to source, you know, from some of the local uh, web markets or local bazaar, you know, that's how we call it. But uh, when we, uh, we, our volume uh, kept on growing, then, you know, for some products, we would reach the critical uh, point that, you know, we can source from bigger uh, players, you know, wholesalers or collectors or even farmers, right? And, uh, but, but of course, you know, uh, sourcing for more upstream players definitely can give us a better margin, which would allow us to better, you know, pass down more savings to uh, consumers and also to our uh, agents. But then doing that also, uh, at the same time brings uh, many challenges, you know, many challenges that we have to face. So, you know, all the way from uh, understanding of the value chain, you know, to identifying products based on different grades or different specs, um, you know, to sorting the products to uh, uh, storage and, you know, um, and other challenges, right? So maybe let me give one, Example. So, uh, you know, we sell a lot of uh, uh, potatoes on our on our uh, platform, and uh, you know, we, we try to source from a place on uh, um, Java Island. Um, you know, um, a few times um, each time, um, and of course, you know, that gives us a much better margin. You know, compared to sourcing from a local market, 
But then uh, there are there are many challenges. For example, you know we we have to uh, take pretty much, and it's it's a uh, it comes in as a mixed grid. Basically, you know you have the very large ones, you have the medium ones, and you have the very very small ones. And depending on size, you know the the you know the the price in the market is actually very different. You know, maybe you could have ten to twenty percent of the very large ones, fifty to seventy percent of the medium ones, and uh, maybe 20, ten to twenty percent of the very small ones. And of course, all the end consumers would prefer the big ones. You know, so so for the very small ones, we have to sell uh, at a much lower price, or we have to sell in another channel, maybe. You know, maybe you know, for example, the horeca channel. Maybe they don't care about the size that much. So you know, um, either way, either way, the margin will be much lower. So this is you know something on the mixed grid. Also, uh, in terms of how to sort, because the product will come in, you know, together in the same truck. Uh, how do we sort and separate? Because in the end, we have to you know fulfill and uh, you know bring the products to the consumers. Uh, by the grade, right? So, uh, you know, um, if we talk about, you know, one product, um, a few times inbound, one time, you know, we talk about, you know, how to maintain this accuracy and also efficiency at the same time, because we cannot do it very slow. At the same time, we cannot allow, you know, a, a lot of errors. Otherwise, there will be uh, complaints from the, from the consumer. Right. So how do we balance that? And how do you know there of course there will be additional manpower required. Maybe we have to design some some kind of machines, maybe not very high tech, but you know, so sophisticated enough to do the job. You know, that's that's uh, you know also something. And also how to how to store the how to store the products, right? I mean if, if you get a product in, in a few times, then uh, probably you cannot sell it in one day. You know, uh, in, for example, for in, in our case. Uh, the shelf life is uh, seven days, but then in the seven days you have to do a, a regular check, maybe every day or maybe multiple times a day to see the condition of the products, and maybe you have to you know turn them around, you know, and uh, uh, filter out those that are not good anymore, and uh, you know keep the ventilation in a in a good condition, and uh, and in this process, of course, there's there's wastage already. Right. So, so overall, I think so. So the point is, the more upstream you go, the more challenges like this you have to face, and also the higher, uh, I mean, a, a higher uh, capability will be required from the team. Um, you know, um, to to really make it make it work, right? And uh, and then and then we 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 you know think about uh, the the old days, like you know, buying from the a nearby market or buying from the night market, uh, although the the price is high, uh, but you know the products will come in clean, will come in all of the same size, already sorted perfectly, and uh, you know uh, the exact amount that you need, and also maybe you can even request for to reject the bad ones during your QC process. So so you know, I think. With that, the the point is, it's not always. I mean, there are many considerations in the process. It's not always a clear answer or a clear choice that, you know, the more upstream you go, the more savings you get. In the end, the net margin will be would be higher. It's not always the case. You know, that can happen if at the same time you also build up your capability, uh, for your team. You know, to make sure that you can handle. Every process, every step in the process, in a very good way, and bit by bit, I think you you know <clears throat> you are able to uh, really achieve savings. And uh, um, yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, that's some some learnings that we you know we got from uh, running running the platform, and I hope you know that can be uh, helpful to the audience. Thank you, Graham. Thanks, Demi, and that's that's uh, absolutely fascinating. And, and it, you know, it's really getting to the heart of it. You know, it's not always as easy as it looks from outside. Um, but now we're going to turn to um, Zimi um, from Hindua Doa, and you know, this this is I think it's probably China's second or, or third largest digital marketing platform, and 13% of their turnover 
is agricultural products. So they're really being confronted with the issues of how do you make something work? And they are selling something like $20 billion of agricultural products. And these are both from farmers directly to consumers and farmers to agribusiness. Um, but Zinni, I mean, one thing that I think, if, could you, could we divide your answer into two? One, one is, you know, what were the key elements that were came into place that enabled you to make that massive success? And then if you go on to some of the solutions, the more detailed solutions, how you consolidate loads in the rural space and consolidate delivery in the in the um, urban space to keep the cost sensible. So over to you, Zinni. Thanks, Graham. So very good questions. Um, and I think we were very fortunate to be started in China, um, kind of at the right place at the right time. So the company was founded in 2015. And um, in the span of five years, we have become China's second largest e-commerce platform in terms of number of users. So we have over 730 million annual active buyers on our platform, about 640 million monthly active users. Um, and about 40 plus percent of these users are also buying agricultural products on our platform. And as Graham mentioned, uh, we had uh, close to $20 billion worth of agricultural products transacted on our platform last year. Uh, so that makes us the largest online platform for agricultural goods in China. So I think some of the key ingredients that we were able to tap on when we first got started in 2015 was that one, I think the logistics uh, development was already quite mature in China. So there had been uh, kind of the preceding 10 years of a fair bit of investment and consolidation amongst various industry players. So I think to a certain extent, being a latecomer to the e-commerce industry was helpful because the other players had made the investments. Um, they had sort of built up this uh, stable of third party logistics players that were all very competitive and um, you know trying to introduce efficiencies to bring down the parcel price uh, to then drive up more volumes for themselves. So I think that was one key ingredient. And the second piece was really about uh, payments. So a lot of the uh, uh, Chinese uh, population, uh, thanks to Alipay and WeChat Pay, uh, really uh, got their first taste of mobile wallets uh, in 2014, 2015, when there was a concerted effort but to really um, get everybody started onto mobile payments. So there was kind of the battle of the rich packets, uh, whereby, you know, in the beginning of 2014 to 2015, there was a lot of promotional activity going on. And that actually helped to ensure that, you know, beyond just the more developed parts of China, even those folks in the more rural parts of China now had a mobile wallet that had some money in it. And so they were also looking for avenues where, you know, they could do something with 10 RMB, right? So something that wasn't necessarily very high end, but still would give them their first taste of e-commerce. And I think agricultural products uh, gelled in very perfectly with that, right? Because it's not a very expensive or high ticket price item, but at the same time, once you have a good shopping experience, you're going to come back, right? So it has a very natural inbuilt uh, high purchase frequency. So that was something that was very useful for us to build up a sticky user base, right, that was ready to uh, kind of transact. And of course, I think the third important piece, uh, which I think, you know, Junaidi uh, alluded to earlier when he was talking about the mapan, was really this um, angle around a KOL or social connection. So each and every one of us, you know, we've got, you know, hundreds of Facebook friends, hundreds of WeChat contacts, et cetera. And in our own respective social networks, we have a different degree of influence on different people and vice versa. So we were able to tap onto uh, basically people's social networks and get them to uh, share together with their friends and family so that they would come together to buy. So I think this provides a very important aggregating uh, driver because for farmers, typically, I think the guarantee that a off-taker would be able to give them is an attractive angle, right? For them to say, I know I'm not really getting a good price, but he's going to take the whole load. He's going to take the whole inventory. So I'm going to get cash. So there's that certainty. Um, so with e-commerce, I think historically how it was developed, uh, that piece was perhaps missing. So with our model whereby we naturally incentivize people to come together, we also have a recommendation feed that naturally kind of um, can push or focus people's attention onto a narrower range of SKUs that can help to generate the requisite volumes 
that farmers would look for in order to have that certainty or have that comfort that, yeah, they can sell a certain amount of product in a certain period of time. So I think that's kind of the genesis of how um, you know, Pinduoduo really got going. Um, so I mentioned earlier the, the existing infrastructure network uh, for logistics was developed. And so that suited, I think, a certain category of um, agricultural goods pretty well, right? Because it's a national network, um, you know, it, it handles things from TVs to sneakers um, to, I think, for the fresh produce, some types like rice, you know, potatoes, apples, oranges, these work relatively well in that construct, right? Because it's shipped in a cardboard box, uh, relatively good shelf life, right, can withstand some bumping around. And so that has historically been, I think, what we have done well as an e-commerce platform selling, uh, you know, from farmer to consumer. And I think for us, that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? That's kind of what we would call agricultural e-commerce 1.0. So those are the products that are easy to plug in to the existing system. And I think it works well as well for giving consumers a wider selection, a wider uh, array of choices. So for you as a consumer in uh, the northeastern part of China, where you know it's cold, um, you don't necessarily naturally have access to say tropical fruits in your local supermarket. Well, through e-commerce, you can place that order, right? And you can get uh, a pineapple, a coconut, a passion fruit or whatever shipped to you from Hainan, right? In the matter of days. Um, so usually those things that are not necessarily very urgent, um, but can give you wider selection than you have in where you are. That's something that's very well served by this model. And then since August of this year, we've also started to pioneer another model uh, whereby we actually rely on local um, kind of infrastructure, local warehouses uh, to try and match localized supply with local demand. So this uh, basically relies on the consumer to fulfill the last mile themselves. So I think a bit similar to what Junaidi and Damon shared earlier with their models, whereby you have someone who's kind of a community leader. Um, so it could be somebody's home, it could be a, a laundromat, it could be a grocery store, but it's existing real estate that's not really being utilized and basically serving as a common point for folks in a neighborhood to then go there and pick up their products because the last mile for logistics is usually the most expensive. So by cutting out the last mile and having consumers you know, kind of do that themselves, uh, we are able to pass on those savings to the consumers in terms of better prices. So the incentive for consumers is that compared to what they have done historically offline, uh, you know, taking a walk, going to the wet market, haggling, picking the specific pieces, that whole journey may take at least an hour, right, of picking up the stuff, going back and forth. Um, and uh, for us, what we saw with COVID-19 was that a lot of the consumers, once they were forced to actually try buying things online for groceries because of the lockdown, um, that habit stuck. So even into the summer months, we saw people were trying to order leafy greens on our platform. And those uh, are the products that don't do very well in the existing construct because they are low price. At the same time, they also have a short shelf life. So it's not um, feasible to use the existing cold chain to ship it from one corner of China to another. But at the same time, we know there are some localized supplies. So how do we basically try to do that matching uh, between localized supply and localized demand and uh, pass on savings to consumers by having them you know, be able to enjoy the convenience of ordering everything in one shot online the night before, place the order by 11 p.m. The next day after 4 p.m., you go to your neighborhood pickup point that's maybe 100 meters from your home, just grab uh, your bag of stuff, and then you just head home, right? So minimal outside contact. So that's kind of a, a complementary model that we have been developing that we believe will expand the total addressable market for fresh produce to be sold online to consumers. Great, Zinni. Can I just ask you one additional question? Can you just explain in two sentences, what is the role of the new farmer, the, the local consolidator? Yeah, so we actually have been working uh, to train up new farmers since our inception five years ago. So we have actually uh, nurtured about 100,000 new farmers in the past five years, and we aim to nurture another 100,000 going forward. So these new farmers, effectively, they're people who are a bit younger, a bit more educated, have some exposure to 
uh, life in the big city, and they serve as effectively the local agri entrepreneur. So um, they themselves may have farms, uh, they are locals, and so the farmers uh, who may be uh, sort of more resistant to change or less educated, they would trust them, right, as uh, kind of somebody whom they know, uh, they've seen since they were kids, and okay, this guy says he's willing to take my product, uh, handle the quality control, handle the packaging, handle the shipping, um, they might be willing to do that, right? And it still gives them better economics because now it's just one layer between them and the consumer versus multiple layers, uh, whereby I think like Dan was sharing earlier on, the farmer has no visibility into where the product is going. So then there isn't this room for feedback, right? So on our platform, because you know we, we work uh, with these new farmers, they serve as the conduit. So they are the ones running the business. They can see in real time which are the SKUs, which are the products that sell really well, and they can feed that information upstream to the farmers that they work with. So we think that this is the key part of sustainable development in the rural areas, right? When you have local talent that works with the farmers and is at the same time connected into the online ecosystem. Mm. Thanks, Zinni. And that was fantastic. I mean, that gives us all a, a sense that it is possible but you know, when you it's, it's spellbinding to see you know how many customers they actually have. But there, are, uh, there was a very interesting TED talk by a serial investor in um, digital technologies who said that in review of all the ones he'd made, the most important piece was timing, and that's what they talked about here with Pin Doa Doa about the the e wallets in place, the logistics were in place, but also how they have fine tuned the model to consolidate loads for the new farmers in the rural space and to lower the transaction costs of delivery by enabling the consumers who collectively buy to collect their product. So some smart thinking there. Junaidi, I wanted to ask you a question. You know, given, given the technology that you have and the fact that there's been such a lot of really smart technology was supplied to the urban logistics and transforming it, um, why couldn't this be applied to the rural space? Um, and certainly our working group from COVID on logistics was, was contemplating the idea of an open source application to enable people in the rural space to consolidate loads from a number of different farmers and then put it out to bids of either empty back halls or um, the local trucker traders so that you have a competitive environment, but also that key point that Sharon pointed out the need for critical mass. So over to you, Ginelli. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, uh, Graham, for, for the questions. Uh, in Gojek, we have been also thinking about this, uh, about whether we can apply our technology, uh, a lot of great things that we build for our consumer in urban, right? Whether we can move that and help also to the rural. I think based on my experience in Mapan, uh, to kickstart, especially in Indonesia, right? One of the challenges is actually smartphone penetration uh, in in rural. Uh, uh, that's that's like one of the first immediate blockers, right? If you don't have smartphones as mm -hmm. uh, individual farmers, then then you don't have access to many things. Um, not only to the demand side, not only to the technology, also to your uh, financial, so on and so forth. Hence, in Mapan, that's why we started by enabling the community leaders uh, and be and make them as so-called like the smartphone of the village okay they're the one who have the smartphone they are the one who have access but at the same time we need to make sure they are the one who is also credible uh in in, in front of all the people in the rural right so uh by having this kind of i would say like imagine like a, a telecommunication tower and make them as the telco tower for rural, make this uh, community leader to be that, then we can enable, even though indirectly, uh, make access to the to the farmers, to the to the people in the rural. That's that's number one. Uh, one issue, which is smartphone penetration. Number two, uh, of course, smartphone penetrations come in play together with the whole infrastructure of data access, so on and so forth, which in Indonesia, in some part of Indonesia is still quite challenging. Yep. Um, that, that's one. Second, uh, the other issue that we see in rural is, of course, this is it's linked to the whole chain, right? The, the income stability. 
and it's all linked, right? If I'm a farmer, I don't know when I can harvest. I don't know when I can get the money. So that digital inclusion, I think some of the questions uh, that I, I receive in the, from the attendees is mm. also talking about, about, about uh, financial inclusion. Um, and, and this is also key. I think Sini uh, uh, also mentioned about financial inclusion, having Alipay, uh, uh, which I pay definitely help. Uh, and I think in, in, in countries in Southeast Asia, for example, especially in Indonesia, and, and probably some part of like Vietnam, uh, Laos and, and, and others, right? Where financial inclusion is very low. Uh, mm. uh, banking penetration is low. Access to financial services is low. Mm. Uh, hence the whole thing about payment, about uh, credit scoring, access to capital will be very limited. Uh, that's, also, that's also the challenge. Um, mm. Now, Again, the, the concept of having community leader is interesting because uh, that's what we, we, we did as well in MAPAN is we are enabling the community leader to be the bank of community to some extent. Uh, mm. They are the one who in MAPAN, we introduce uh, rotational buying and savings. So we see like uh, people like, uh, like the, 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 the farmers, right? they go to this community leader deposit only like i would say probably only like five cents a day mm. just to make sure because they know if i hold the money actually i'm going to spend it but if i give to you trusted community leader i know you will keep it for me you will have the bookkeeping for me and i know my money going to be safe with me. Mm. Um, so so that definitely help because if you don't have financial access then you cannot um, to some extent, buy things. If you don't have any inflow of goods to rural, then logistic will be expensive. Yeah. Because then you always depending on you deliberately send your truck to rural to pick up and, and bring it back to urban, right? Double cost for sure. So if, if there is no goods flow from, let's say, another city to rural, and the whole logistic cost will be expensive. Yeah. So so it's it's a as, as as Dan mentioned, right? It's not like even though we have technology, it's not a, like six months kind of project. Hmm. It takes time. It takes the whole ecosystem, uh, and we need to educate the whole system to go up together. Uh, financial inclusion, logistic, digital penetration, smartphone penetration. Those are the basics that need to be put in place. Once you have that, then we can talk about uh, a bigger technology. I don't know, drone, um, whatever thing. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, but Janady, look, thank you very much for that. I mean, it's, and it's fascinating what you've been saying, because one of the most interesting things that emerged for us was to see the effectiveness in Cambodia and um, to some extent in Myanmar of mobile money. Um, and we've got this fantastic case in wing money in Cambodia because farmers don't take credit cards, um, they expect cash. But what they have set up is a network that you can pay the farmer digitally and he can take his smartphone down to the village where there will be an agent who can convert that into cash. And by using that, they are building a, a marketing platform to enable agribusinesses to purchase from farms, whether that's um, corn for CP or cassava for um, Taiwan. But Sharon, I wanted to ask you a little bit, because I know that you came up with quite a smart workaround on the issue of um, uh, overcoming some of the transport difficulties by, by clustering farmers around agribusinesses. Can you just uh, elaborate a little bit on that for us? Okay, so um, right now we're developing a digit. We have the digital source mapping platform for farmers. As, you, um, as I presented a while ago, it's really very expensive because we're we're composed of islands, so it's and um, we're not as um, evolved in terms of uh, logistical support as compared to other um, other Asian neighbors. Mm. So um, first, we have to look into what approach we would want for farmers. We're uh, focused on um, it. Uh, our transactions should be uh, more transformative rather than transactional. It's not just a one-time thing with 
with, uh, for, um, in, in dealing with our farmers. We have to um, train them and then um, uh, train them to become um, agripreneurs and um, see um, if they're profiting from, 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 the, from, from the crops as well. And then second, we would want to see them involved in the digital um, source mapping, uh, in the digital landscape right now. Mm -hmm. Because um, a lot of our businesses in the Philippines have failed because um, a lot of people failed to pivot towards the digital platforms. Mm -hmm. So um, we're um, supplying our farmers with cell phone, with mobile phones and um, tablets and um, giving them some um, um, internet Wi-Fi so that uh, we can then we train them so that um, and then um, so and then when they're enabled and then we that's the time where we can align them into the value chain. We mm -hmm. would look into um, area uh, manufacturing firms that are in need of their products that, that are nearby. Then we cluster them and then um, that's how we start um, dealing with um, our um, the rural logistics in in, in in these areas. Great, thanks, Sharon. Damon, I wonder if you could, uh, you know, there's been some fascinating ideas that have um, been thrown around here, some of the solutions, some of the work around, some of the problems. Um, what, what are your takeaways? Are there things here that, that have struck you as interesting, particularly for Chili Valley? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. I mean, it's, uh, it's great to hear uh, from from everyone, you know, on the uh, potential solution, right? I, I think um, definitely we we need we need a deeper understanding of the of the whole uh, value chain, and particularly on the you know farmers and the collector side, right? Um, you know, um, yeah, I think we we will also put in you know more more effort in terms of having people in the field, um, not only in the office, I mean people in the field who you know run around. Uh, in uh, different places, you know, to mm. visit to visit the farmers, visit the collectors, to really build up a uh, long-lasting and meaningful relationship with them. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much the the direction that we'll go. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, Dan, um, what, what's and have there been some interesting ideas emerging here when you've heard about China or? Or what Janadi is doing in in um, uh, Indonesia, and what whether that's applicable to Thailand, and we have a you know we have a, a question from uh, um, Andrew Hamilton asking you know how, how might what are you, what are your suggestions about how we can improve logistics with Thai small farmers? Are there interesting ideas emerging in in China and in Indonesia? Um, that might be applicable, or is there something that's come from this conversation which has got you thinking, and that you will pass on to the logistics committee that you're part of? Over. Yeah, I, you know, I think that the China case is quite interesting, hmm. um, but but then again, you know, China has massive scale. Yeah, and um, uh, it's 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 something you know I've, I've heard of the company before, and um, it's it's. D definitely something that I, I would, you know, I'll, I will speak to our committee on. Um, mm -hmm. I think <clears throat> right now there, there's two, as I kind of mentioned in the, in the, in the talk, there's, there's kind of two primary challenges. Um, you know, the first one is addressing kind of the unnatural monopolies. Um, that, that's one thing, which is yeah. a more sensitive subject. But then, you know, the second thing is kind of just like the core infrastructure and how, um, how farmers can, can basically um, uh, reduce food wastage, right, and the deliver product. Um, and then uh, the government is already trying to map out, you know, some of how they can create kind of like a digital platform, which is quite interesting. Um, unfortunately, we, you know, we don't have that expertise to develop like a digital infrastructure for them. Um, I feel that they're kind of somewhat lost in a way, um, yeah. but I think their head is in the right direction. Um, and so it would be interesting, you know, um, to, to if, if anybody is, who's here is interested in looking at you know, how there could be some kind of digital connectivity, whether it's within Thailand or using Thailand as an export base or with other within with, with, within the region. Okay. Um, Zinni, um, yeah. so uh, just, tell, just tell us something about how is the logistics actually collecting from farmers organized? I mean, I, I understand that there may be a difference in China. Most of Indonesia and elsewhere, there are thousands of very, very small truckers, quite informal businesses, people that are not very digitally um, aware and may have problems with their smartphones. Whereas I, I, I think 
if I've understood it correctly, that you have a few very large, well-organized logistics companies. Is that right? And and how do they organize so that they they utilize back halls? They make collections work effectively and efficiently. Yeah. So I think uh, you know if I if I gave a, an introduction to the Chinese logistics industry, it would be a fairly long um, presentation. Uh, so to say, I think it has undergone a period of evolution, and yeah. I. It may not be too much of a stretch for Indonesia, I think, one day to kind of evolve down that path as well. And I think certainly there are some interesting e-logistics startups. Uh, I think like there's like Wear6, like a few of these guys, Cargo, uh, that are all also trying to uh, basically make the whole um, you know, supply demand situation on trucking a, a lot more streamlined and uh, you know, enable on an app. So basically in China, um, you know, today the industry has largely coalesced around, I would say, four major industry players, a number of which uh, they are listed, right? So some have further um, specialties. Um, so SF Express, for instance, is widely regarded as the premium player. Like this is the guy that you want to go to uh, if you are dealing with uh, things that are very urgent, time sensitive, uh, or if you require cold chain handling, right? So for instance, some of the farmers on our platform who sell things like strawberries, uh, lychees, mangoes, things that have um, you know, high economic value, but relatively fragile, they would use SF Express and it would actually be advertised on the listing. Like, hey, you know, when you buy from, from me, uh, I will ship it to you using SF Express. So that is almost like an added thing that consumers ascribe value to because it's it's high end, it's trusted, it's very premium. For most of the parcels, uh, I would say you know, uh, pop like major players like ZTO, YTO, STO. Uh, there are a few like smaller ones in in certain regions, um, but by and large, these are like the nationwide players with a very strong footprint. And of course, there's China Post. So we do work with China Post quite a bit because uh, for the more rural or sort of isolated areas, China Post is the mandated national carrier that has to have a certain amount of coverage for these areas. So China Post, uh, to some uh, extent in some areas, they actually take on an aggregation role. So a few months ago, we announced that we partner with uh, China Post to help them beef up their uh, footprint in um, some of the rural areas, whereby actually the local China Post office would serve as uh, kind of the aggregation or pickup point. So the farmers would actually drop off their fresh produce at the China Post office. China Post basically performs the role of uh, kind of the first layer intermediary of doing the packaging and everything, and then getting it dispatched through their network. Um, for other kinds of uh, logistics players, they operate through a franchise model. So what this means is that they set um, the national kind of like standards or nationwide standards for their franchise. Um, and some of these small truckers, like you say in Indonesia or other countries in the world, uh, they would sign up to be the franchisee, right? So I've already got a certain amount of space or trucks or whatever in my uh, hometown area, or maybe I cover my hometown and the adjacent town. So these are people who already have some resources um, and so what they would do is they would join to be part of this nationwide uh, brand effectively. And so um, what they do is they will handle the kind of first and last mile, right? So they would be the point where they collect uh, things from the farmers. Uh, and it's also the last mile in terms of dispatching e-commerce parcels uh, from other parts of China to the end consumer. Oh, Graham, I think you're on mute. Ah uh, yes, I know. Here we are. Um, look, we got a great question. We've got three good questions here. Um, two, in fact, from Marie Ord Even, um, and so this is to all of you. Um, do you ha have you a positive experience about public-private partnerships, um, and what kind of supporting, enabling environment it would enable that to actually happen? Particularly this, the last mile logistics, um, and and the uh, being able to include farmers and consumers. Who would like to take that question? I would like to answer that, Graham. Sure. I've worked with uh, we've worked with governments on small projects and big projects. Um, the of uh, right now we're working with um, the Department of Agrarian Reform because um, they have farmers around three hundred thousand farmers, and they would want um, 
um, the crops purchased by consumers are integrated in the value chain. So we're working with them in um, having them uh, the profiles included in their digital source mapping. So that will help our farmers in marketing their goods and um, bringing them to this to the consumers. Mm -hmm. And a smaller scale also, we have uh, worked with the Department of Agriculture to deliver um, vegetable goods. So uh, for, for, for beneficiaries here during the COVID. So we um, told them that uh, we were purchasing these goods. Can you please deliver them to Manila? So that in a way is um, how we work with our government. Great. I mean, I know that in India, um, the government has worked with the logistics sector with six of the major truckers to develop a, an application to enable better utilization of backhauls and so on. Now, switching to Mary's um, next question, which is in the interest of consumers and food safety, um, uh, and, you know, one scandal could destroy your website. Um, how do you mitigate the risks of um, food safety issues? Um, Dan, I think that one has got your name written all over it. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, could you re repeat it? Yeah, so, so this is a question from Marie. In the interest of consumers, in food safety and the increasing um, along COVID, one scandal could um, have a damaging okay. effect. How, how, and um, how might one re mitigate those risks, talking about these sort of new logistics platforms? Over. Well, my, you know, my, my business is slightly different. And so sure. we, we're actually manufacturing based. And so we make end, end, end products that are delivered to consumers. Yeah. And so from a food safety perspective, we, you know, we make sure we ensure that um, in, ingredients and um, raw material that are coming into our factories um, do meet uh, a certain standard that we set. And then, you know, through the production process, we, you know, we're, we're audited and we're compliant with various um, regional um, sort of food safety certification boards around the world, like, you know, BRC in Europe, FDA in the United States, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so for us uh, on a, as a fully integrated player, you know, we're, we're audited across the supply chain. Um, but obviously to prevent um, scandals and recalls, and we've never had a recall, you know, knocking on wood, um, it, it's a lot of vigilance in terms of kind of transparency within the supply chain, ensuring that farmers are um, adhering to our to our um, uh, to our policies, um, we we obviously can't trust that, and so we spot check as well. Um, yeah. Produce setting, um, checking um, with lab, you know, doing lab checks on on ingredients and raw material that come into our factories. Yeah. Um, I, I think from a chilled and throat and a cold chain perspective, if you're delivering fresh fruits and vegetables, that's going to be something that's a lot more complex. In fact, in Thailand, to this point. Uh, Two weeks ago, there was a meet, there was front page newspapers every uh, in, you know headlines everywhere because they had randomly tested uh, organic, inorganic produce on supermarket shelves here in Bangkok and found chemical residue, and in fact those who were non organic actually um, fared slightly better, and so um, th that that kind of um, brings me to the point where um, the pro the problem is you, know, you you could you could grow the the, the vegetables and produce, even if it was organic, right? But then, you know, if there's possible contamination in the logistics part of that, rather than set, you know, packing it and then delivering it in a cold chain enclosed vehicle, you know, you're throwing, um, you know, uh, bushels of um, say kale, for example, in the back of a pickup truck mm -hmm. that goes like 800 kilometers from like a farm to central Bangkok. Yeah. There's gonna be cross contamination at some point because it's just out in the air, right? And so, <laughs> um, That's great. Look, yeah. thanks, Dan. And I'm, can, um, Zinni, can I switch that question now to you as well? I mean, you know, you've got, um, you know, hundreds of uh, millions of, of consumers and, and hundreds of thousands of farmers. How do you make sure that those farmers um, don't create food issues that would, would it negatively impact your whole business? Yeah, so that's a good question. And so actually, I would say our approach to this has evolved as the company uh, grew. So when we first were founded in 2015, uh, we took an approach of being a first party platform. So this meant that we actually took uh, inventory of the fresh produce. And so we were responsible for the quality control before we then packed and shipped it out to consumers. 
Um, and then gradually, as the business grew very quickly, you know, we expanded to like 100 million, 200 million, even more consumers. Uh, we started to sell other types of products. So once you have multiple categories, it gets very hard to manage it all on a first party business model. So that's when we decided to cut completely and change to a third party business model. So I think the complication there is that in a third party business model, uh, we can't have all the products pass through us before it goes to the consumer, right? And effectively, if it did, it would also add to the time. So the stuff may not get to people in as fresh a state as it would. So the way that we've uh, basically addressed this is multifold. One is uh, we do have a mystery shopper uh, kind of quality control program across the whole platform. So basically for farmers that come on board and start selling the produce, uh, a sample of them will be subject to the mystery shopper, right? And so we yeah. would be able to see, okay, you know, this guy's selling apples, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the order of like 10 apples, like two of them came like rotten or like whatever it is. So we would kind of note that, right? So we have an internal uh, kind of assessment of how good that, that merchant is. And then actually, because we already have such scale, um, the users are very important in helping us do that check. So unfortunately today, it is a bit more retroactive. So it's more um, using the scale of consumers on the platform, using uh, the volume of the feedback that they have generated to do that course correction. So what this means is that typically for a user who receives a, a produce or a product from the platform, they'll be prompted to leave a review. So it's just as simple as like five stars on product quality, on service, uh, timeliness, et cetera. But that basically gives yeah. us a lot of data on an ongoing basis that we would be able to mine, right? So we can actually mine the text that people are writing like, oh, terrible, lousy, bad. Uh, yeah. We can also mine the images and we can see, okay, if there's a lot of photos where there's rotten fruit or like bad fruit, then that is an indication that this is not a very good uh, merchant. So then we would actually, uh, the score, the quality score of the merchant goes down. And so that means in terms of their visibility to users on the platform that goes down. So it would be very hard for somebody who gives bad service or bad product to get even more incremental business. So that's kind of how we actually try to keep the, the incentives of the producers or the farmers or the merchants aligned with that of the consumers by having this very strong feedback mechanism. And I think down the line, we're also investing in technologies that can allow us to be a bit more proactive mm -hmm. and have testing uh, distributed throughout the supply chain. So we have entered a research project with the Singapore Institute of Food and Biotechnology Innovation here in Singapore, whereby uh, we're trying to come up with a method for testing fresh produce for mm -hmm. pesticide residues that mm -hmm. would be both uh, lower cost as well as very portable, very fast turnaround time. So ideally, this would be something that we can put in the hands of maybe the farmers or the cooperatives throughout the entire supply chain, such that, you know, you can actually catch or filter out the low quality produce at an earlier stage. Perfect. Thank you very much, Zinni. So, I, Maria, I think the answer to your question is um, there's a fair bit of trust that builds up, but, they, um, but transparency and verification um, are really important and, and certainly this is one of the big issues facing the industry but it's a work in progress. So that last question goes to you Junaidi um, and it's a, a quick one. Can your platform work in other countries or is it do you have to have a local application? Uh, uh, actually where uh, Gojek has been now we are already in four countries in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we have uh, we have proof that the platform can work in other countries as well. But I think one thing that I think we need to note is uh, uh, we build Gojek uh, predominantly in Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, Definitely, they, uh, in terms of market expansion, what we are looking at is really a market that is similar to Indonesia, yeah. uh, where you have a lot of inefficiency, big demand size, a lot of uh, informal economy, all those things, uh, smartphone penetration, so on and so forth. So uh, I think the question is definitely, but of course, uh, you cannot say like we don't take into account the local nuances. I think local nuances, understanding the local 
industry dynamic i think whenever you we expand it's something that we need to take into account technology okay. at the end of the day it's just technology for it uh, the man behind the sorry the people behind the technology uh, are the one that that can use the technology to the most uh, use Thank you very much, Nnedi. And, and Sarai, I think that the answer is de yes, definitely, but you've got to adjust it for the local circumstances and businesses like to go into somewhere new, which is pretty similar to where they've already got experience. Um, this, this brings us to the end of the, the question session. And, and let me first of all say a big thank you to some real experts and bringing into um, our understanding, you know, some of the problems and some of the solutions that are coming out in the rural logistics space. Um, as I said at the beginning, logistics is one of those places which is critically important, but probably underappreciated. And it, it, it is so critical because it does one thing that we all want to see is to lower the transaction costs. Because if we can lower the transaction costs, there are two things that can come out of it. Either you can um, lower the price of the product to the consumer and or you can increase the price to the farmer. And um, the, you know, what has emerged is that there is a lot of inefficiencies, particularly in that first mile connectivity. There's been incredible developments that have happened in the last mile delivery. And we've, we've seen Janady and Gojek talking about <laughs> tying these pieces together, the first mile connectivity, the middle longer term connectivity and the final piece, actually getting it to the consumers. We heard um, Pin Dio Dio coming up with a very interesting solution, which seemed to be coming up with Sharon and, and Damon too, was this emergence of somebody, an agripreneur to consolidate loads. And the smart idea in the consumer side of being able to get consumers to collectively buy together and collect from some sort of local storage to cut out some of those tra important transaction costs. Um, and, um, I thought that was a lot of very interesting lessons emerging out of there. But again, let's go back to all three, of, all five of you and say thank you so much for your time, for your expertise, and for getting us thinking about one of the remaining big problems in farming, which is how are we going to connect farmers to urban consumers um, and that digital will be part of that solution and an important part. So, um, Wayley, let me pass that back to you and, um, and uh, finally a goodbye from me. Thanks, Graham. Thank you so much to our five panelists. I think you can see that there are some really interesting overlaps and commonalities despite the different geographies that you are coming from and the different stakeholders you're working with. Um, I'd just like to launch a final poll for the audience just to give us some feedback on how, whether this session um, was useful uh, to you. And in the meantime, um, JQ, could you go to the next slide? And while you guys are um, voting, I'd just like to highlight uh, our digital directory, uh, which is a database that GrowAsia maintains of almost 70 um, agri-tech solutions being used in ASEAN. Uh, covers a really wide range from financing to drones and farmer advisory. Um, you can scan the QR code on your screen to go to the directory and um, feel free to reach out to us through the through the website if you know of an agri-tech startup or solution that we have not captured there because we are always interested to include more startups in that network uh, as a resource for all our stakeholders who, who might refer to that. Um, so thank you so much for voting and um, I would just like to thank you again to our five panelists and for um, the audience too on your engaged participation on this topic of rural logistics, which is really, really crucial uh, in our region. And uh, on behalf of Grow Asia and Padang and Co, I'd like to wish you a happy end of 2020 and look forward to seeing you online and hopefully in person as well at a digital learning series event in 2021. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.